to start or to continue this session from stars to life. We had this morning more the stars side, and I think that now we are going to proceed little by little to more life aspects. So the origin of life is, of course, an important question, not only for this meeting, it is also the starting point for biology, and it is also a crucial point in the evolution of matter in the universe. This is, of course, a scientific question that scientists can explain in materialistic terms from its uh, chemical roots, from the type of abi abiotic organic chemistry that we call prebiotic to the first life forms. However, we don't know the details of this transition, how it happened, the question mark there. Uh, uh, and we may never know because life, uh, the origin of life, is also a historical question. So even if we uh, build a, a, a plausible model of how life evolved from its chemical root, and even if we recreate love in, in a test tube, the, this, the history of it may escape to us forever. So that's something important to have into account. Now, science tries to narrow down that question mark over there. And it does so in two different ways, a bottom-up approach from uh, sim simple elements and molecules in the universe, and also a top-down approach starting from extant biology, trying to de determine the least common denominator and how this first life force might have been. Uh, it is, of course, an interdisciplinary type of research with astrophysics and chemistry contributing to the bottom-up approach, but also geology, when it tries to set up the starting conditions uh, when life evolved on this planet, the only example that we know for the moment, but also geology contributes to the top-down approach by uh, trying to date the emergence of particular groups of organisms uh, dealing with the difficult uh, early uh, fossil record. And of course, biology and how uh, or what can biology tell us about the nature of the first life forms? If we look into extant biology today, we have uh, data from molecular phylogeny and also from micro molecular tools applies to the, applied to the study of uh, environmental diversity that uh, all organisms fall into three uh, major groups or domains of life. Um, and of course, this can with all the loads of molecular parasites, including viruses, plasmids, plasmids transposons, and the like. And these domains are the archaea and the bacteria, which uh, are characterized by simple cells. All of them are microbial. Um, but with an extraordinary uh, diversity of metabolisms and eukaryotes with a wide morphological diversity, including animals and plants, and many different unicellular lineages as well. Now, despite this incredible uh, diversity of mor morphotypes and also metabolisms, uh, all uh, life shares the same common biochemistry and uh, uh, a genetic code, and this authorized to think that there was a last common ancestor from which all these organisms derived. Now, scientists have been trying to portray this common ancestor from comparative genomics and phylogenomics, and we came to the conclusion that it was already a rather complex organism, which had a nearly modern um, ribosome, a machinery to make protein synthesis, and we heard ab about this yesterday in other genats talk quite a lot, but also likely transcription and perhaps DNA, uh, a DNA genome with replication. That's much less clear. The other thing that is very well conserved in, li in extant life is the presence of an, an ATPase uh, in, uh, attached to the membrane that makes ATP, the uh, universal energy currency from ADP, thanks to the creation of a proton gradient across the membrane. So that's very much conserved. There are, of course, many questions relating to this uh, uh, well, last common ancestor, including uh, the nature of the genome, whether these properties belong to, to a cell or to a population, and also the nature of the membrane, which is somehow discussed. But I think that there is rather compelling evidence to say that this membrane was made out of phospholipids, and if you want to know more about this, I direct you to the poster by Jonathan Lombard. At any rate, we have here a rather complex ancestor, so it, it is, uh, uh, this must have been preceded by more simpler cells. 
uh, and this is the way that biology, this top-down approach, tries to uh, proceed by defining the uh, increasing steps in complexity here, and the same is being done on the other side. Now, one crucial question that remains regarding the origin of life pertains to the precise transition, when and how it occurred in chemical terms. So if we plot some kind of complexity or likeliness property of life a long time, did life uh, emerge uh, uh, along a gradient of increasing complexity and at, at a given point we we put life, we consider that we have enough properties to consider this life, or on the contrary, uh, life was the, the consequence of a kind of a steeper transition with the emergence of certain properties in a much faster time. So we don't know the answer to this. And the, where we place the bar of life depends very much on how we define life. There are many types of definitions of life, but most of them can be reduced in, in, in the essentials to two extreme, extreme types of definitions. Uh, meta the metabolic ones, for which energy is the keyword that put forward self-maintenance as the essential property of living systems. And on the other side, we have the geneticist views for which information is the keyword and that uh, uh, consider self-replication and evolution as the irreductible properties of life. Most uh, physicists would be comfortable with metabolic uh, definitions uh, because living systems are, so, are, of course, far from equilibrium systems that create continuously order from disorder. Whereas mo most biologists would agree with the geneticist view because, of course, ev of course evolution is a um, major powerful mechanism to explain biological diversity, but also because evolution can be recorded in genes and genomes to a certain extent, and this can be reconstructed, and contrary to metabolic reactions. And so uh, this is something important, and also biology has become much more much gene-centered since DNA was discovered, and much more now that we have complete genomes and we can sequence a lot. Of course, you have intermediate uh, definitions that try to marry the two types of properties, but when it comes to uh, define a, a succession of events leading to life, uh, most scientists would favor that either metabolism appeared first, we have some models here, such as the oparins, view of the origin of coacervates and cells or the iron sulfur world, for instance, from by Wachterhäuser, or uh, see, uh, models where a replicator appears first, and we would have here, as a good example, some views of the RNA model. So this type of opposition or, or dichotomy has been classically viewed in this uh, paradox or uh, what came first, protein or DNA, catalysis or genetic information, this egg and chicken uh, paradox. And of course, you all know that the, the answer to that was RNA. And the, when, uh, when we discovered that certain RNAs have catalytic capacities, ribozymes, and so the idea of an RNA world, the idea that once upon a time uh, RNA uh, had uh, this capability of being at the same time the molecule carrying genetic information and doing catalysis was natural. However, the idea of an RNA world, even if RNA uh, certainly had a, an important role in the past, is not without difficulties. And these difficulties can, come from different things. One is that there are many RNA worlds in the RNA world, and by that I mean that there are many different hypotheses underlying this heading, from an RNA-only world, which is something rather unlikely, to an RNA peptide world, or some more complex worlds where, where we put membranes, etc. So now we need the details, we need to define what we are talking about and referring to by saying RNA world. The other thing is that we have problems with the synthesis of RNA and its precursors under, under prebiotic conditions, but we know that there were many uh, organic molecules there, uh, uh, amino acids, because they are all everywhere, but also D peptides, three peptides, many of which have indeed catalytic activities. So it would not be impossible to think that some of these um, oligopeptides have had some kind of catalytic capacity leading to the synthesis of RNA. And in this case, we will be coming, up, down, coming back to this same type of paradox here. And 
now uh, the third point that perhaps is difficult in the RNA world is that it does not actually resolve the, the origin of energetic metabolism. In extant cells, metabolism uh, it, it derives or, or is intimately linked to membranes thanks to the generation of a proton gradient across membranes, either by photons or by redox reactions linked to the, an electron transport chain here, so that this chemosmotic potential is used to make ATP across this gradient. And so how to link this metabolism to a potential uh, RNA or RNA-like uh, uh, replicate, replicator world or something like that is not clear and is not clearly established or defined by any of the models that are actually being considered. So we need to progress in that. And perhaps one way to think about that is that uh, the two type of properties of systems co-evolve influencing mutually to one another in some kind of course of protocell because in, among others metabolism is linked to the membrane. So this is something um, that is uh, possible. And perhaps one of the answers uh, to this will come from uh, synthetic biology uh, and it's much more pro pragmatic approach because if we really want to make biology or life in a test tube, we better have some type of metabolic activities that fuel the replication of any kind of uh, genetic system. So I think, I hope that we will hear a lot about these uh, questions, open questions, in the next few days. But I'm certain now that the next three speakers will talk about some of this and will bring elements for the discussion. And so, without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Adi Pross, who will speak about uh, how on toward, we will bring us toward general theory of evolution, extending Darwinian theory to inanimate matter. Thank you. So Adi, please.